we do tests that indicate how well you hear and understand speech. Speech audiometry uses a familiar test signal. When you take a hearing test, it's an unfamiliar signal. You're not used to listening to tones in a room and pressing a button when you hear those tones, but you are used to listening to speech. And by your responses to speech, we can tell that you are doing the test with the tones correctly. So when you respond to the tones, we get a certain value, and that, that value or that number is used when we want to see how well you hear speech. So we compare the two scores. You should hear the speech at the same level you hear the tones. And we go on to test about speech <coughs> discrimination or word recognition, how well you hear speech in a quiet situation. And that provides information about how you would do if you wore hearing aids. Because we can test your ability to hear speech and then make that speech louder to see how well you understand it. By having amplified speech, do you do better? That's what we would want to know. If you wore a hearing aid, would you actually understand better? So this speech testing helps us understand how well you understand in quiet, how well you understand when speech is made louder for you with a hearing aid, and we also do some tests that have noise in the background. Just like Dr. White mentioned about the Christmas party, how well would you understand speech at a Christmas party, for example? The noise in the background is, makes it difficult for you to understand what's being said, particularly when you have hearing loss, but there are normal hearing people that have difficulty understanding speech and noise. When I look at an audiogram, I can't predict how well you'll hear and understand speech in a noisy environment. It needs to be tested. When we gather that information, it helps us determine how well you would do with features of a hearing aid, special microphones or other equipment that works in conjunction with hearing aids. People wear hearing aids and hearing aids help them hear better. Their best performance with the hearing aid is when they are six feet or, or less from the person talking to them. When they increase that distance, then their speech understanding may become compromised. There are devices that work with hearing aids wirelessly so that you can preserve your speech understanding and do well in a noisy environment. For example, it's possible to have a wireless um, receiver that would receive a signal from a microphone for example, I would wear the microphone today and if you had hearing aids and that wireless receiver, you would get a very clear signal at a distance. So someone at the back of the room, more than that critical distance of six feet, they would get a very clear signal directly into their hearing aids. So we gather a lot of information from speech testing in quiet and speech testing in noise to help you choose a hearing aid that would work well for you. The Better, hearing, and the Better Hearing Institute reports consequences of untreated hearing loss. If you don't treat your hearing loss, you could, over time, develop negativism, become irritable, experience fatigue and tension and stress, feel lonely because you're not doing the social things that you would normally do, Notice reduced alertness and personal safety. Do you hear the doorbell? Do you hear the phone ring or the smoke detector? And just overall diminished health. By treating your hearing loss, you could help to reduce those negative consequences. And that's, those are bonus, and you know, in addition to the having the treatment for the hearing loss. It'll help you hear better, but to reduce fatigue, tension, stress, and give you more of access to social situations would, would be a definite benefit. By not treating your hearing loss, um, you would miss out on social events in life, and treatment of those, treatment of hearing loss would help with communication in, in relationships, increase your social, socialization. For example, maybe you don't go to church or meetings that you used to go to because you don't hear as well. You would feel more of a sense of control over your life events. 
because you were more part of the conversation, um, more part of conversations with physicians and feel more alert. Improve your mood by reducing anxiety and feel less depressed. <laughs> Improve confidence because you feel like you're getting the message, just like when you didn't understand something and then the light came on. So it would improve your confidence by feeling that you are communicating as best you can. Improve your safety by alerting you to things around the home, noises that you should be hearing like the phone and the doorbell, and make it easier to communicate. Think about a, a time when you've been communicating with someone who speaks with an accent and how much work that is. It's the same amount of work or maybe even more when you have hearing loss and you are trying to communicate. So by treating your hearing loss, you can improve a lot of those things to improve your quality of life. Should you have an audiology evaluation or a hearing test? There, on the following slides, there are some questions and they're also on a hand uh, on your table. Uh, you don't have to answer them now, but think to yourself as I read through them. The handout would also be helpful for you to take to your communication partner if they're not here today. If you both fill out the question about yourself, the questionnaire about yourself, you would have likely different answers from the person that you communicate with the most. So should you have a hearing test? If you could answer yes to three or more of the following questions. Do you feel embarrassed when you meet new people? Frustrated when talking to members of your family? Difficulty hearing? Uh, difficulty talking with coworkers, clients, or customers? Um, do you attend religious services less often than you would like? You can think to yourself, am I answering yes or no to these? So three or more would indicate you should have a hearing test. It goes on to say, do you feel slowed down? Do you have difficulty when visiting with friends or relatives? have arguments with family members, difficulty listening to TV or radio, do you want that volume turned up and that would then cause problems for other people trying to listen to the same station? Does it limit or hamper your personal or social life? I particularly like that question. You may say it doesn't, but the person you communicate with, they may say it does because they're not talking to you as much because they have to repeat themselves or they have to talk louder or maybe they would choose to not go to the movies because they have to repeat things. So that's why I think it's nice if you take those questions seriously and ask them to another person that you communicate with. Do you have difficulty hearing when you are in a restaurant with relatives or friends? So if you could answer three or more of those with yes, you may want to talk to your physician about having a hearing test. On to the vestibular assessments. Audiologists often do vestibular assessments and I'll mention the two that we have. This is a picture of video goggles for the test called video nystagmography or electro-nystagmography, whether the patient wears uh, video goggles or electrodes. And it's one of those things you have to experience. <laughs> um, you wear goggles or electrodes and watch a light move across a bar in front of you, move your head into different positions, and at the very end your ear is stimulated with air or water for a minute, and that gives you the sensation of moving. The total test takes maybe an hour. Uh, it does test the vestibular system in your ear. It's one of the services that we offer. And that is Ashley, the other audiologist, gracious enough to model for us. And the next test is video head impulse testing. This test takes 20 minutes and it's not as involved. Instead of you moving or having your ears stimulated with air or water, you would wear goggles and focus on a target in front of you. So you would look at a spot on the wall in front of you and the audiologist would turn your head in short movements. The advantage of this test would be that it's 20 minutes, there's no prep. Um, people would feel it would be more comfortable. You may be able to have it done on the same day that you come in for a hearing test. 
uh, it can be done on a relatively short notice. But it also tests the inner ear, the vestibular system of your inner ear. Many people experiencing dizziness may not realize that we have inner ear tests available to see if that's the cause of the dizziness. To show you that we offer those two tests, your doctor would choose the most appropriate one for you. Um, it's not that I'm trying to compare one to the other as one is better, they're just different tests that we offer to assess your inner ear. Just like Dr. White mentioned, there are many causes of dizziness, but if your doctor suspects it's an inner ear cause, then you would likely come for one of these tests. If you have vertigo, dizziness, or lightheadedness, then you may be seen for one of those tests. Any questions for me before we go on to <coughs> Kelly? Water and air in the ear. Why would you? Why would you do that? Oh, um, sometimes people have a hole in their tympanic membrane, their eardrum, and they couldn't be tested with water, so air would be more appropriate. People, patients feel that air is more comfortable than water. They both um, have the same effect on the ear. Some examiners would choose water over air. That may accompany hearing loss, yeah. and it may, it may be a sign of many other conditions or a result of many other. Well, is there treatment for it? Is there treatment for it? Is there treatment for the tinnitus? Right. Uh, sometimes, yes. It, it depends on what causes the tinnitus. It can be related to medication or other health conditions. Audiologists often treat tinnitus. You may notice less tinnitus when you wear a hearing aid. Okay. We'll go on to Kelly to talk. Kelly is an occupational therapist. Okay, thank you. All right, so as Barb said, my name's Kelly. I'm an occupational therapist at the Meadville Medical Center. And I'm going to be talking about fall prevention and things that you can do in your home to keep you safe from falls. So Dr. White kind of went over some of um, way, things that can cause falls, some risks. Um, intrinsic factors are things that are within our body that might be changing as we get older. So things such as decreased strength, decreased balance, decreased mental functions, such as poor problem solving or poor safety awareness. Um, acute and chronic diseases, like he said, stroke, Parkinson's disease, things like that. Sensory deficits, which is um, like your neuropathy, which is caused a lot of the times by diabetes. Um, orthostatic hypotension, so this is when you become dizzy when you stand up too quickly. Or the BPPV, which is the dizziness that Dr. White was covering earlier. Um, decreased reaction times. A history of fall and then getting older or increased age. Um, some factors that are outside of our body which would be extrinsic um, would be polypharmacy which is taking multiple medications, environmental factors, alcohol abuse, and then things we do in our daily tasks such as climb the stairs or get in and out of the bathtub. I'll focus mostly on the environmental factors today. So common mechanisms of falls during daily tasks, standing while dressing. I work at the transitional care unit mostly, and I always encourage patients to be sitting down when they get dressed. Sometimes, you know, we're in a hurry and we want to just slip our shoes on, but it's so important that you sit down, you know, take your time and not be hurrying. 
climbing on step stools. We find this a lot in the kitchen. Now sometimes there are things that are out of reach. I'll cover that further down in the presentation, what we can do for that. Um, transferring in and out of the bathtub. This is um, a really unsafe task because the floor can be slippery. You know, we want to take major cautions when we're doing that. Reaching into high or low cupboards and then our toilet routines. General environment modifications, um, really important ones, remove your throw rugs. You know, your toe can get caught on the edges and that can be a big tripping hazard. Replace or remove torn or lifted carpeting. Avoid thick carpeting. Um, improve lighting within your houses. Have um, night lights for in the nighttime. Ensure that the pathways aren't cluttered. Use glow in the dark switches so that you can see when you go into a possibly dark room. Keep electrical cords tacked against the wall and not in any walkways. Um, if you have an assistive device that your physician or your physical therapist may have prescribed you, you want to be using that in the home. We don't want to see people furniture surfing or grabbing onto things to get around the house. And finally, you want to either be carrying a phone with you in your pocket. Cell phones are so much smaller these days, it's, it's easier to carry around or have a life alert button. So things that we can change in our homes. With the stairs, we want to make sure that we have handrails at least on one side. Better yet would be on both sides. Make sure that you have good lighting going up the stairs. Um, if your stairs are wooden, make sure you have non-slip non surfaces. And then um, maybe outdoor steps, you might want to think about having a bright line or like a reflecting tape outside so that you don't trip on the edges. In the kitchen, you want to make sure that you have your commonly used items at counter level or within reach. So cups, plates, bowls, you know, things that you use all the time. Make sure that they're really accessible because that's when we find that people start using step stools and that's a major tripping hazard at home. Um, there are reachers and grabbers out there, all kinds of different kinds. Um, they're very helpful for lighter objects. We don't want people using those for heavier things from the top shelf, though. Um, if you have a family member or close friend um, and you're planning on doing some heavier cooking, you know, have them bring down the mixing bowls and things that might be stored up high so that you can get to them safely. If you need to use a step stool, they have sturdy ones that do have handrails on them if you don't have anyone to help you out in the kitchen. Um, and finally, make sure all your Cupboard doors are closed and drawers are closed. Sometimes we're cooking and doing things really quickly. Quickly, We leave them open and then you know you might bump your head on it or trip over a drawer that might be open. So make sure we're closing those. In the bathroom, you wanna make sure that you have a non-slip mat in the tub or the shower. Install grab bars around the toilet and especially in the shower area. We don't ever want people to be using the towel bars as grab bars. They're literally just for washcloths, just for towels, and they won't support the weight, which is a major hazard. Um, use a shower seat or a tub bench. There's lots of really safe equipment to help you out for a safe shower routine at home. Um, if you're having troubles getting off the low toilet, you might want to get a riser, or like I said earlier, the grab bars near the toilet. Um, uh, something I was found very interesting, leave the bathroom door unlocked. If anything happens, if you do have a fall, you know, your family member or somebody can get in there and help you out a little bit more easily. And also, do not rush to the bathroom. A lot of urgency, we find people are rushing, and that's when they get tripped up over their feet and then might have a fall at home. In the bedroom... We want to avoid wearing full-length robes or the robes that might have the really long ties that might trip us up under our toes. I put these really cute slippers on here because we want to kind of avoid these too. You want to have something that has a back to them, you know, something that's going to be very safe for you to be wearing at home and not scuffing around in slip-on slippers. Um, again, make sure you have open pathways. Sometimes in the bedroom, you know, we might toss off our shirt and leave it on the floor. You want to make sure that you're getting those up and not leaving those on the floor. Um, glasses, if, you're, if you have prescribed glasses, try to wear them. You know, those are important so that you can see what's going on in your environment. 